This introduction section has been done after the initial recording of the forum due to some technical difficulties. Salam and welcome to Forum for Ideas. This week we did a discussion on the report titled Somalia Country Economic Memorandum Towards Inclusive Jobs Agenda, authored and presented by Ms. Natasha Sharma, Senior Economist with the Macroeconomics Trade and Investment Global Practice at the World Bank Group. This forum was held by the World Bank Group and facilitated by Heritage Institute for Policy Studies, also known as HIPS. Thank you all for joining us. My name is Yasmin Hassan. I'm a consulting program coordinator at HIPS. I served as a moderator for the forum. Our panelists include Dr. Hussein Warsame, member of the National Economic Council for Somalia, Ms. Asa Bereset, senior private sector specialist East Africa unit at the World Bank Group, Mr. Jibril Hassan, chairman of the Premier Bank, Dr. Jan von der Goals, economist in the Jobs Group at the World Bank Group, Dr. Awais Abdullahi, senior researcher and lead on economics at the Heritage Institute for Policy Studies. Giving the opening remarks are Matthias Meyer, who is the World Bank Senior Operations Officer for Somalia and the Program Manager for the Somali Multi-Partner Fund, and Dr. Afiara Elmi, the current Executive Director of the Heritage Institute for Policy Studies. Um, I first have to send um, the apologies from my country manager, Christina Svensson, who would have loved to be here and who has followed um, both process and, and the report quite closely. And we're excited um, about being here among friends um, at the HIPS, um, and we're super excited um, for an interesting um, panel discussion. Um, Somalia's commitment to the debt relief process over the last years um, has been critical for us, allowing the World Bank to really re-engage in Somalia and step up our efforts um, to support our mission of alleviating poverty and promoting shared prosperity. Many of you connected here um, know that this was an uphill battle over the last years, but since 2020 March, we are delivering IDA resources in Somalia. And those resources provide a range of support, um, including technical advice, the preparation of analytical works, and project operations investments. We also have a growing pipeline of projects in Somalia that work in areas as diverse as the financial sector, social protection, recently more health and education. And uh, this fiscal year, we even approved an energy operation. All of those investments um, are informed with a um, strong analytical program and investments in increasing the knowledge base for poverty reduction. We in the bank um, do the uh, instruments like the country economic memorandum to better understand the countries and people that we serve um, uh, to engage in core studies and to understand better what challenges and opportunities exist for us. One of these core studies is called the country economic memorandum, the one in front of you and the one which we want to discuss today. This is a report that looks at the current and future drivers of growth and how jobs can be created over the coming period of economic development. This report is produced every five years in major client countries. And this is a, a big opportunity after our re-engagement for Somalia to join this club of major client countries producing these reports. We in the World Bank use this country economic memorandum and other reports to inform our discussion with government, with civil society organization, the private sector, other development partners, and particularly to inform the design of our operations that are financed um, uh, through country systems and delivered across Somalia. The focus of this country economic mem memorandum is important. We did not take it lightly to choose a topic um, uh, uh, that wasn't relevant to the current development trajectory, but the team has chosen one that is permeating through our portfolio. In Somalia, a priority for us is to include women and vulnerable groups in the growth and job creation process. In Somalia, around seven in 10 men are estimated to have a job, but only about four in 10 women and youth of working age have jobs. We wanted to understand the challenges that leave women and vulnerable groups behind. To do this, Natasha and the team working on the CEM used all available data and worked with a group of Somali researchers to understand the economics on the ground. And the product that you have, uh, uh, that you have in front of um, you is a result of that process, working across the academic field, the development partners, the private sector and academia. The objective of our discussion today 
We want to take a forward look to the opportunities and challenges in Somalia. We are interested in hearing wider Somali perspectives on the challenges that we are highlighting. How can more women and youth get meaningful jobs? How can growth in Somalia be lifted and sustained? Those questions keep our task teams, our colleagues up at night. We try to find new ways of tackling these questions. So your kind of your contributions today and going forward in a hopefully continuing conversation between the World Bank, the private sector and civil society organizations can continue to inform our future operations and learning more about how we can work together to overcome those challenges. We will continue to be an active partner in Somalia's development and we look forward to work with you in the private sector, in the CSO, in academia and in government together for the economic um, development agenda. With this, I want to close and uh, send you all um, uh, our best wishes and uh, uh, good luck for this important session. We will stay connected and uh, 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 follow the discussion keenly. And um, uh, uh, Dr. Elmi, um, uh, thank you again for the invitation to co-host this um, with HIPS. We are um, uh, keenly interested in taking this forward and thank you for the invitation. Yasmin, back to you. Uh, I'll bring in Dr. Fiare, please. Thank you so much, uh, Matthias. That was very insightful, and um, and and thank you so much for taking the time to give us that breakdown. Um, please, Dr. Fiare, go ahead. Thank you very much, Yasmin, and thank you very much, Matthias, for the brief introduction of about the study that the, uh, the group has just completed. I just wanted to say a few words about the collaboration that uh, we have just initiated uh with uh with the group uh and it has been going on the discussion has been going on for a while but uh fortunately this is the first uh, uh initiation where we are going to be uh, at least hosting or uh, uh being part of the dissemination of some of the studies uh that the uh, the world bank actually uh, conducts in somalia uh, as heritage institute uh, for policy studies uh, one of the main uh, areas that we are going to be uh, doing uh, studies on is this uh, uh, jobs and growth jobs and all of these things that uh, Matt is just talking about. We just com concluded a study uh, on youth unemployment, which will come out soon. I'm sure Dr. Awais, uh, who was the lead uh, researcher, will say a few words about, uh, about that study and some of the findings, I, I hope. Uh, but here, basically, I wanted to thank uh, all. Uh, what we plan to do is just to disseminate these things in multiple platforms and more or less uh, to, uh, uh, to even discuss maybe in Somali language uh, 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 so that people understand uh, what uh, the World Bank and, and other major donors are, are doing. Uh, this, this is more focused uh, technical discussion because of uh, the people uh, who are now participating. We have academia, we have private sector, we have, I mean, uh, uh, think tanks. Uh, these perspectives, I hope, uh, will enrich the discussion about the uh, study. So I want to welcome all, and I want to thank, and we're looking forward to uh, operate further with the World Bank Group. Uh, so thank you, everyone. Uh, we're, we're look, I'm looking forward to, to, to good discussion. Back to you, Yasmin. Thank you so much, Dr. Afiare. Um, and uh, thank you for your remarks. Um, so moving forward, I think I'll just give a bit of a breakdown of kind of the rules of how the forum is going to uh, happen. Um, Ms. Natasha uh, Sharma will take up to 20 minutes or so to do the presentation of the report. And then following that, each panelist will get up to seven minutes to give their point of view. Uh, we will then open up the uh, for questions from the attendees. Um, so if you have any questions, even if uh, you have questions as the discussions are ongoing or as the presentation is happening, please just put it onto the Q&A box and then we'll get to it. Um, 
if you would like to come in and ask the questions after all the panelists have spoken, we can also, you can just raise your hand and then we'll bring you in to ask your question live. Um, each discussant or panelist will then get a chance to respond to the questions. Um, any other panelist who wants to chime in can raise their hand and then we'll bring you in. Um, so if that is fine and everyone is okay, I'll move on to introduce um, uh, Ms. Natasha kindly. So the presentation um, will be done by Natasha Sharma, who is the author, who is the lead author and presenter of today's report. Uh, she is the senior economist with the Macroeconomics Trade and Investment Global Practice at the World Bank Group, where she is currently working on Somalia. Natasha works on a range of issues, including the economics policy dialogue, debt relief, and the agenda for supporting growth and jobs. Um, thank you so much, Ms. Natasha, for uh, making time to uh, do this presentation for us today. Please come in whenever you're ready, um, and then let me know how I can assist you, uh, with your presentation. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Greetings. It's really an honor to be here. We've had um, several conversations with Gibbs and with many of the distinguished colleagues who are connected to this call. And to finally arrive at the time where we can be sharing our products and, and engaging with all of you through this, these types of forums, it's, really, um, it's really a pleasure and, and we're, we're very happy to continue this type of collaboration. Uh, so as, as Matthias had mentioned, these are the types of reports that we conduct in our major client countries. So after we conduct this type of analysis and this type of report, we want to avoid a scenario where uh, these reports get put on the shelf and uh, they, they're laid to, to gather dust for another five years. So what, what we're really trying to do, especially in this period where we're waiting for a new government to be formed, is to use the analysis that we have and to engage the key stakeholders in Somalia to hear your views on the findings which we are generating. So, with that said, I am really, really looking forward to, to the discussion that we are going to have. And um, Yasmin, I would kindly request uh, for you to put up the presentation and to, and I, I believe you will be um, taking the controls with this type of presentation. Um, I can put up the presentation and I can also give you the controls. So it just depends on, um, on what you prefer, but um, okay, I'll put it up just now. If you can put it up, I'm happy to take the controls. Thank you. Okay, great. I've just given that to you. There you go. Okay, thank you. All right. So here's an overview of the report. In general terms, the context that we see in Somalia is one where, aha, uh -huh, this is going a bit uh -huh. faster. Sorry, contact over here. Is that okay? Yes, that's fine. Okay. Okay, so the, the context that we see in Somalia is one uh, where is one that we've um, termed as a triple challenge of low labor, lab, low levels of labor force participation low productivity and high levels of poverty against a backdrop of low levels of inclusion. So the objective of these types of reports is to identify priorities for stimulating job creation and economic transformation, but within an inclusion, with an inclusion lens. And this topic of job creation, of economic growth, it goes to the heart of what the World Bank Group is about. We see our mission as being one of reducing poverty, and sharing prosperity, but that can't happen without growth and without creating, creating jobs. So in this report, I'm going to briefly um, provide some of the context that we see um, from the World Bank Group's perspective. I will then discuss um, jobs and productivity with the available data that we have. And then I will discuss some of the constraints how, and how some of these constraints can be addressed to create jobs to create more jobs and raise productivity. I should mention that when we conducted this report, it was um, before the National Bureau of Statistics released its 
and Labour Force Survey. This report was finalised in June of 2021. So there are, there are new data which are available and which we'll be considering for our future analytical products. The, the main sources of data that we used to produce this report were four surveys and, and the, the details of those surveys are within the report itself. But in addition, we partnered with uh, some local researchers who are based in Somalia and they uh, gather data for us from all of the federal member states and, and Somali land as well to give us a better sense of this economics in, on the ground. So throughout this presentation, you will see some quotes from the people that we spoke to. And what we wanted to do was to bring some of these challenges to life. So uh, this is a, a quote uh, from, from a woman that we spoke to in Bella Duane, who, who explained to us that sometimes I face the challenge of finding buyers for my products due to a lack of money and unemployment that exists in the town. So really uh, drilling home the, this importance of, of raising growth if, we, if we're going to create jobs. So based on the data which we had at the time of conducting the survey, um, we found that just over half of the Somali population is actively engaged in the labor market and that women and youth were at a considerable disadvantage. When we looked at worker productivity in Somalia, we found that it was about a less than a quarter of the sub-Saharan African average. When we look at productivity, we measured this in terms of real GDP um, per worker. So this is just a chart which um, puts Somalia against, against the peer countries. And that's how, that's how we try to um, compare performance in Somalia relative to others. Sorry, Yasmin, I seem to have lost the controls. Oh, have you? Um, yeah. Okay, let me just, uh, okay, uh, if you stop scrolling and then I will, I'll try to give it back to you. Okay. Um, I'll just take it from you and then I'm now giving it back again. If, if others can see, I can continue. I have it on this version. Are you okay now? Um, okay, I'm trying to change the slide. It, it doesn't seem to work. All right, I can uh, take back the control and then I can help you if that's okay with you. Okay, of course. I, I'm seeing um, several requests for um, to share the report. I will certainly send the link. It's available publicly um, and, so, and I'm, ha I'm happy to share the link to this report. All right, um, and then also following this, I'll just put it on the chat and I'll also ask anybody who has the link, uh, they can just add it to the, to the chat as well. All right, Natasha, I'm taking the control and then I'm going to help you with the presentation. Okay. Thank you. All right. Okay. Um, do you want to go next? So we're starting at six. Yes. Please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. And then meanwhile, we see that poverty rates are amongst the highest in the world. So we estimate um, that about 69% of the population lives below the poverty line of $1.90 a day. And then we see that poverty is multidimensional. So it's not just a question of, of having money to survive from the day to day, but it's also access to those services which are so critical for the well-being of the population, such as electricity, health, education, water, and so on. Next slide, please. When we think about the demographics in Somalia, we have uh, what, we see, what we say is a very young population. So this means it, that, the, the, that the challenge of finding jobs is absolutely critical. Each year, we estimate that an additional 161,000 workers will join the labor force on a net basis. So when I see, say net basis, that means that we consider those workers who will enter the, the labor force, but also those who will leave. So this is really a tremendous challenge. Next slide, please. And as I was saying, this question of growth is absolutely fundamental to the jobs challenge. When we look at the data that we have in Somalia, what we see is a very, um, is a very stop start 
uh, growth trajectory. After the provisional constitution was adopted in Somalia, we saw that growth started to take off. Then there was an extreme drought and then things slipped. Then again, things started to take off. When Somalia reached the HIPIC, uh, the heavily indebted poor countries initiative and uh, decision point in 2019, which is when the whole debt relief process started, as the World Bank and the IMF, we estimated, or well, we projected, that growth would reach about 3.5% a year. And that was a conservative scenario. But then what happened is we had COVID-19, we had floods, we had the locust infestation, and again, we had this contraction in growth. So all of this is to say, all of this is to say that whilst we see that there is a huge potential in Somalia, the challenge is that there are so many shocks that keep hitting the economy, and that is what contributes to the stop-start and pattern of growth. Next slide, please. And we put this in the, in the broader context of one where we see that state building is ongoing. We have a very dynamic private sector, uh, which has really been adapting to a situation where there's a low regulatory environment. We see that women face barriers to engage in policy making. This, the, the relationship or the bargain we say between the state and the citizens is weak because it's really the private sector which is providing services. And this is also in a context where there are very, very high levels of debt. So Somalia is grappling with all of these challenges. It's a really challenging environment. Well, so this is these are all the this is all the backdrop to consider when we think about this and um, how we're going to create jobs and, and raise growth. Next slide, please. So as the World Bank Group, we have something called the Jobs and Economic Transformation Analytical Framework. So when we think about these types of challenges that countries face, um, from, a, from our central level, from our corporate level, we've developed this framework, which considers, first of all, how workers can be, uh, sorry, which considers, first of all, how a private investments can, uh, can generate jobs. And secondly, considers how the productivity of workers can be raised. And in Somalia, we took these two pillars and we put on it a gender and inclusion lens, given the low levels of labor force participation of women. Next slide, please. Uh, Natasha, just a second. I realize that we're sharing uh, the slide in a way that, so let me just, um, let me just do it. Is it full screen now? I can't see it anymore. Oh, okay. Um, Sorry. Is it okay now? Yes. Okay, great. Was it this slide or the previous one? I think the previous slide. Oh, okay. Okay. So this is just an overview of the framework. Um, on, on the left-hand side where we see um, pillar one, which is where we, with these job creating private investments, we consider factors such as how stable is the macroeconomic environment? Is inflation under control? And what's the status of the enabling sectors? And, and there we think about finance, access to finance, the quality of infrastructure, trade and integration. And what's the, what's the quality of the business environment? And are there competitive markets? And are, is technology in place to raise productivity? In terms of the second pillar, where we look at productivity, the main focus is on human capital, on entrepreneurship, social protection, and labor markets. So this is a huge agenda. What we did in the, in the report is we, we provided a summary of these major components, and then we did a deep dive analysis, one which considered the first pillar and the second which considered the second pillar. Under the first pillar, we looked at trade and integration, and under the second pillar, we looked at entrepreneurship. Next slide, please. So to start off, we had a look at where jobs come from and how productive they are. Overall, and I guess this is no surprise, um, we found that entrepreneurship in all of its forms is really the major driver of employment in Somalia. And that it's really, really important for employment of women. We found that entrepreneurship accounts for more than half of all steady jobs that household entrepreneurs provide a quarter of all jobs, 
And in comparison, established businesses contribute to about one in every 15 jobs. And the reason why we say that um, entrepreneurship is so important for women is that we found that female entrepreneurs are much more likely to hire other women. And here in, the, in this chart, you can just see a breakdown of all of the different types um, of entrepreneurship. Next slide, please. So in terms of the types of activities that entrepreneurs are engaged in, I mean, initially before undertaking the study, and I should also say that um, last year, the World Bank issued a report on jobs. And I would also share the link um, to that report with you. And, and prior to uh, considering these data, when at least before I started working on Somalia, when I would look at the images that are shared, I would have this um, a notion or a conception that I, that a lot of jobs are they come from this agricultural um, side of the economy that is very rural. I see the pastoralists, I see the camels, I see the livestock. But the data told us a different story. The data actually um, told us that it's commerce and personal services which dominate among business activities. So it's actually the services sector which is so important for jobs. And this perhaps is not a surprise when we consider how fast um, Somalia is urbanizing. Somalia has got one of the highest urbanization um, rates compared to other countries in, in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, my colleagues have also undertaken another report, it's called the Urbanization Review, and I can also share that link with you. And it explains some of the factors behind urbanization. Next slide, please. So back to this question of where do jobs come from? So when we look at, um, we looked at larger businesses in Somalia, we looked at these enterprise surveys. I mean, there are limitations to all of these data, the enterprise surveys really um, draw on data from, from urban areas. But what we found was that larger businesses in Somalia have got the ability to hire rapidly. And what's really interesting is when we compare the Somali experience with other peer countries where we could get similar data, we found that the, the pace of hiring in Somalia is much faster compared to these peer countries. But the problem is these large businesses, they're just so few and far between. What does this imply? It implies that if there were the enabling conditions for the business environment to be one where larger businesses um, could, could continue to grow, that there was greater stability in the economy, that medium-sized firms could become large-sized firms, the potential for job creation here is tremendous. We found that when we looked at these household enterprises, we found that the, a 5% annual growth rate in household enterprises could create an equal number of paid jobs. And moreover, we also found that household enterprises show signs of expansion over time, especially those which have been in existence for six years or more. Next slide, please. So how productive are businesses? We found that household enterprises have got much lower levels of productivity compared to these established larger formal businesses. In fact, if we compare the two, we would say that established larger formal businesses are 10 times more productive than household enterprises. However, over the short term, supporting these household enterprises is important. And this is because these are jobs which can be accessed by the poor. So if we're thinking about how to make a dent on poverty reduction, how to really turn the needle on poverty reduction, household enterprises really can provide jobs in this regard. Over the medium to longer term, as I was saying, supporting the enabling environment for these larger businesses to thrive and to flourish could help to create rapid hiring and jobs of higher productivity. So it's not to say that one is better than the other, it's to say that both are needed and both come with their own benefits. Next slide, please. So what correlates with productivity? And I should also say that because of um, data limitations, when we consider productivity in Somalia, the, the measurement we are using is median sales per worker per day. 
we found that overall there were three overriding factors that were important for productivity or areas where we would give more attention. The first was gender. We found that female entrepreneurs have far lower revenues than men, and this ranges from about 33% to 40%, depending on the type of firm. And I should also mention that this finding is not unique to Somalia. We find that this is the case in, in Somalia's peer countries as well. So it's that firms which are led by men, they seem to do better. In terms of sectors, we found that it was the services sector which, were, which was more productive compared to other sectors. And on this chart here, we, we do a comparison. And in here you can look at the, the relative levels of productivity of services compared to other sectors. And then this is something which was actually surprising to us. In other countries, we see that firms where there is a higher level of education, we expect to see higher levels of productivity. In Somalia, we didn't find this very, very clear link. We only found it um, in established businesses, but not so much for household enterprises. And this may also reflect the quality of education. And it's something that as investments in education continue over time, we may expect to see some changes in what the data show us. Next slide, please. So the gender productivity gap, as I mentioned, we put a gender and inclusion lens to this challenge and we asked what holds women back. And this is one of the key questions we asked when we went to the field and we talked to people. Just to break this down, some of the key um, challenges that were raised were, were related to norms and perceptions that a woman should only work if her husband is perceived as not earning enough and to support the family that childbearing and household responsibilities were given greater importance. Women were excluded from more profitable segments of the value chain, such as trading currency, such as trekking with um, camels in search of better prices. Um, women were absent from networks that are dominated by men where information is shared on trading practices. Next slide, please. So, this, I, so, so far I've given an overview of what the data shows us on where jobs come from, what correlates with productivity, and now we move into the section of how constraints can be addressed to create more jobs and raise productivity. So, um, just and, and as I mentioned, when we did our analysis, we focused on these two issues of trade and integration within Somalia and on entrepreneurship. And to bring some of the voices back to this discussion, a, a woman working in a retail trade in Basaso told us that men have um, better opportunities to get finance compared to women because they can easily interact with bank owners. Women are not as literate and therefore they're hesitant to ask someone to fill the forms for them. So it was these very, um, uh, these barriers which would come even at a very early stage in starting the process. Next slide, please. So what our analysis on trade showed us, so as I was mentioning, where jobs come from is the, is the services industry, but services are traded and goods are traded. So we wanted to understand more about trade in Somalia. And, and the reason for this is that when we think about Somalia, we know that Somalia has got this fantastic location in terms of its proximity to the Gulf Cooperation Council countries, in terms of the proximity to the East African region, to the um, Horn of Africa, and um, to other markets in Asia, there is such a huge potential there. But if there are barriers to trade within Somalia, that means that there are, there are factors there, there are barriers there which dampen competitiveness. And it's this competitiveness which needs to be raised for Somali producers and Somali traders to be more competitive when, when they go out in, in, in the global market. So that's why we really focus on this, the, the, the domestic market. I should also say that um, the World Bank released a report last year. It's called the Horn of Africa Regional Economic Memorandum, which looked at trading relations within the Horn of Africa. And I can also share that link with you. But what did we find out about the Somali domestic market? We found that it was fragmented and that we found that the main drivers of this segmentation were transportation prices, particularly in the central and southwest regions, and poor land transportation. 
And what this means is that the potential for interregional trade is limited. And we also found that this made cross-border trade more attractive despite some of the exi existing restrictions. So we found that city-states were trading, for example, with Kenya or were trading with Ethiopia rather than trading with regions within Somalia. Next slide. So when we look at these barriers to trade, we looked at the cost structure for long distance um, transportation across some of the major um, corridors in Somalia. And we found that um, overwhelmingly, the biggest um, driver of these large costs were related to checkpoints and roadblocks. Next slide, please. So what does this all mean? So as I was saying, that there, there is um, already this trade which exists between the city-states within Somalia and the neighboring countries. And so there is this de facto regional integration, which happens in, on an informal basis. But this regional integration could be, could be supported, and this could also be a source of, of job creation, including for women. In the short term, there could be the possibility of improving infrastructure and services, especially focusing on some of the most strategic corridors as well as the border areas. And also introducing some governance measures to reduce the multiple taxation which exists on these um, on the checkpoints, which I mentioned, could help to reduce um, costs. Over the medium term, there could be greater regional collaboration and integration. And by reducing economic distance, we could help to facilitate movement from, from the lagging areas to the leading areas. And when we say leading areas, we mean those areas where there are more, there's more strategic corridors, where there's greater um, possibility for job creation. Next slide, please. Okay. And then the second um, deep dive analysis we did was entrepreneurship. So what we did is we looked at the types of constraints that entrepreneurs faced, and we broke this down by type of entrepreneur. We found overwhelmingly that um, businesses are different sizes, but there was such a um, similarity, let's say, in the types of challenges that were mentioned. So for example, Medium-sized firms and micro-sized firms and small-sized firms all found access to land to be a real challenge. Access to finance was also a very big challenge. For larger firms, this issue of corruption came up time and time again. And then again, we found that the, the challenges that women faced um, were even more profound, especially when it came to, act, to access to, to land and, and getting a space um, which could be used for, for business purposes. Next slide, please. So as I was mentioning, the, we see a concentration of jobs in, this, um, in the commerce value chain. So there's a lot of activity that happens in this value chain. But when we look at the evidence um, globally and regionally, we find, find that it's very challenging to raise productivity in this value chain. So we also considered the opportunities for diversification. And when we thought about diversi diversifications and moving into other value chains, we looked at where there could be the potential to raise jobs. And some of the, um, the value chains that our analysis showed us included hospitality, transport, and potentially the food sector. We found that there could be a real possibility of diversifying other agricultural value chains, especially if there is the enabling infrastructure in place, such as roads to facilitate access to markets, such as power to facilitate the development of the coal chain, and of course, improve security conditions. And then again, is supporting the environment for the private sector to do business, especially for small and medium sized firms through improving the regulatory framework, developing correspondent banking relationships, integrating Somalia's financial system within the global financial system could make a real um, could make real headways and um, for, for boosting productivity. Next slide, please. And then, of course, human capital. It all starts with people. If we don't improve the productivity of Somalis, if we don't improve the quality, access to quality education systems, access to quality health services, then there, there won't be the people in place 
to, to deliver these jobs and to, uh, to raise the productivity within the economy. Today, we have a situation where the net, net school attendance ratio in Somalia is amongst the lowest when we compare to peer country, but we know that this can change. There is so much capacity, there's so much potential, and there are also new investments coming into education. So I hope when in, in the next five years, when, when we look at these data, I really hope that we will see a change here because investing in human capital is so critical for growth. Next slide, please. So this is just moving on to some of our rec uh, summary recommendations and what we, what we consider as moving towards the future and um, the future drivers of jobs and growth. Next slide, please. Okay, so this, uh, this slide has a lot of text. I don't need to go into all of it, but um, just to highlight some of the key reforms and investments that came up from our analysis. So for the private sector to do business, for, for people to, to have a, earn a decent living, we need to have greater macroeconomic stability. And the way we would encourage that to happen is to continue to, uh, with the process of addressing Somalia's high levels of debt, through the heavily indebted poor countries initiative. It's, uh, we'd also encourage the, the strengthening of trade integration within Somalia, which can really serve as a platform for boosting regional trade and trade with global markets. And land, as I mentioned, comes up time and time again. So looking at the governance of land tenure, looking at the possibilities for business development, access to capital, and um, especially for women and for youth, um, and then also the, the possibility to diversify outside of retail really depends on, on having these enabling conditions in place, such as power and renewable energy sources. We've seen with the, this recent Ukraine and, and Russian conflict that oil prices are rising. And at the same time in Somalia, the, the potential for solar power and wind power is amongst the highest in the continent. This is a potential which needs to be realized and it helps to mitigate against some of these global risks. And, and then addressing the, the enabling environment for the private sector and improving human capital outcomes. So that's just a, a broad brush summary of what um, of, of the recommendations that this, this report brought out. And, um, and, and next slide, please. And I've put some guiding questions here because this, this comes, the recommendations, they come from the, the analysis that we've done as the World Bank Group. We've had um, discussions already with civil society, with government, consultative discussions with government, um, with development partners. But all of this, it requires a concerted effort amongst everybody. It's a partnership and it's a collaboration. And what we're really here today is to hear your views. So I've, I've put up some questions here and it would be great and um, to hear your thoughts on these questions on how Somalia can realize some quick wins. How can women and youth be better um, supported? How can the constraints that smaller businesses face be overcome? How can the private sector be supported? And how can we support um, integration and harmonization across Somalia to avoid fragmentation? These are just some of the questions that have come to, to our mind as a team, and we'd be really delighted um, to hear from you. So with that, I will close uh, my presentation and uh, hand back over to Yasmin. Thank you so much. Uh Thank you so much, Natasha. That was very in-depth and it was very informative and it was a good breakdown of what exactly the report is um, trying to communicate. Um, I'll just go over the, the rules again. Um, again, thank you everyone for joining. My name is Yasmin Hassan and I serve as the moderator for the forum. Um, what we're going to do now is because we started a bit late, so apologies on that. We would like to request that we keep you guys on for an extra 15 minutes just to make up for time. Um, I will now move on to the panelist um, uh, point of view. What we want is for them to kind of either address the questions that Natasha put forth or just speak on the report or anything that they think that is relevant to this discussion. Um, I will limit the discussions from the panelists in our five minutes instead of seven, uh, so we can make time. And then if we have an extra 15 minutes, then we can bring in the audience also and, and get in you know, remarks and questions from, from the attendees. Um, the first panelist to come on will be Dr. Hussein. Uh, Dr. Hussein Warsame. 
who is a full professor and the accounting area chair at the Haskane School of Business, University of Calgary. He is also the Chartered Professor, Professional Accountants, CPA Faculty Fellow of Taxation at the Haskane School of Business, University of Calgary. For a couple of years, he was uh, the chair and of the combined area of accounting and business technology at the Haskane School of Business as well. Um, and just to remind you also that Dr. Hussein Rosami is a member of the National Economic Council for Somalia. Dr. Hussein, please come in when you're ready. We have five minutes. Can you see my uh, screen? Yes, please. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Yes, as Yasmin said, I am Professor Hussein Warsame uh, with the School of Business, but also with the National Economic Council. Uh, my presentation will be, to, well, I will try to be very, very short. I received the book. It is a big book, 128 pages, by the way. It's not a, just a study, it's a book. I only received it a couple of days ago. So I hesitated to, uh, to review it, but then I said, I will review it for two reasons. Number one, because it is in Somalia and it's attractive to me. But secondly, I was also asked to do this by Dr. Uh, Afiara Ilmi, who I uh, was one of the people who actually encouraged him to go for a PhD. And I wanted him to join my University of Calgary, but ultimately he joined the University of Alberta, which is our sister commit. But we are the five top un research universities. We compete at uh, University of Alberta and us. So I was only happy that he was also uh, there. He became a very highly respected academic, so there, therefore, I cannot, I cannot really complain at all. Uh, so, for those two reasons, so I want to thank uh, the people who did this study. It is a great study on Somalia, definitely it is. And I would like to thank the World Bank, the Heritage Institute of, uh, of Somalia, also the organizers of the forum, including Afiare and all this, and. The people who did the study, especially Natasha Sharma, who just presented me, Vivek, uh, Vivek Suri, Asset Islam, Christina Svensson, and Keith Hansen. I would like to thank all of them. Thank you very much. Now, whenever I discuss a study or a paper, I always ask myself on two general questions and three sub-questions. The two general questions is, what do we learn? What did we learn from the study? And the second one is, can we believe them? Can we believe what the study has told us? Well, that will depend on the answer to these questions. What is the problem that they are trying to solve? Why is it important to solve? And how was it solved? That means how was they said it done? So if we talk about the problem itself, they, they are seeking to understand the opportunities and constraints of creating jobs, which is very, very important. So they ask these two questions. How can, uh, uh, where do jobs come from and how productive are they? A very important question. And then the second question that they ask is, what, uh, how can constraints be addressed to create more jobs? And these are important questions, important questions, straightforward. So why are they important? We're looking from their side as well, first of all. Of course, we're looking from Somalia is important. Uh, the Somalia Country Economic Forum, which they represent basically, the, it is their main objective is to inform economic policy dialogue. And if that is going to be the case, then definitely uh, they have to talk about ways to stimulate growth and job in Somalia. They have to talk about that. And uh, so this uh, country, economic memorandum uses what we call jobs and economic transformation, which has two pillars. The main pillar is creating private investment. And the second one is, of course, creating, uh, uh, building the capacity for, of workers, these uh, two. So since that is the main objective, then yes, it is important. It is important. The questions that they are asking are important, both from their respect and from Somali perspective as well. Now, how did they do the, the, the question is, is what we also, well, what they did is they of course collect a lot of quantitative data. Some of them are a little bit old, like they said is, that were done earlier in, in, in Somaliland, 2012, the one in Hergesta that was done. 
The others that were done in Mogadishu, in Bosaso are more current, 2019. So they did their primary uh, uh, research as well, not only secondary, but they also build on uh, earlier uh, work, which means uh, uh, the literature review, which is okay, which is absolutely legitimate. So for that reason, they have done what was required to be done basically. So in general, what did they find? That uh, services is the most common sector of employment, of course. But also they found that uh, uh, cross trade, cross border trade is an important thing, which means people are trading with Djibouti, people are trading with Ethiopia, and others are trading with Kenya, and especially Ethiopia. And that's not surprising given the figure seven of Somalia, that's not surprising, but it's also because there are constraints, there are bad roads. There are, so for example, they, they in fact calculate the cost of taking something from the port of Mogadishu to, Bel uh, to Bulahawa, and it is extremely costly. Therefore, it is easier to bring it from the border. Same thing with Togwa Chale of, of uh, for example, the north. Uh, all, all those kind of, so it is actually very, very, it is uh, uh, research. Some of the entrepreneurial that they were talking about, the entrepreneurship, they mentioned that actually Somalia has a broad tradition of, uh, of, of entrepreneurship, and it is absolutely true. Uh, they also talked about the fact that uh, lately, from 2017 to 2019, people were actually, uh, big business were, were being established and they were creating jobs. 13% growth, which is highest compared to be, uh, Sub Saharan Africa. I wouldn't put too much on that trading because we were actually starting from a very, very low level. We were starting from, so later on, let us see how that changed in the coming five years. That if that goes down to 7% uh, or 8%, I wouldn't be surprised because of where we were starting from. They also talk about productivity and entrepreneurial choice, which was very insistent actually. They say that the person's productivity is measured in sales per worker. And uh, for the, generally, for the household, I mean, is people who own little businesses that run from their homes, it is two dollars per per person, U.S. dollars. A little bit more established business, the one that has, for example, offices somewhere, but that is not big business, five dollars per day. Big businesses, twenty-six. It makes sense. It makes sense to me uh, as I go to Somalia most of the time and see. So therefore. Uh, they, when they were talking about productivity as well, they talked that men are more productive than women in this case, because they have the capability. They have the money, they have the land, they have these kind of things. Also, however, even for those, it depends on education. That was very, very good. I think that they, they came up with that too. So gender, there is a big gender gap when it comes to women. And, um, also, to quickly summarize, uh, some of the uh, 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 some of the constraints include geographic and economic for an, uh, communities. Yes, even uh, land and Somali land are, are not completely training with each other. Although they are to some extent to doing that. Also, uh, for example, uh, especially. Uh, uh, South Central regions are having a lot of difficult. So therefore they are pretty effective, uh, preferring to trade with neighboring countries. And th so that's what they write this sentence. They say, national fragmentation may paradoxically be encouraged regional integration through informal cross-border. So it is true. And it is also because of the figure seven, I would say. So uh, basically supporting econo uh, uh, more greater domestic and regional integration would help basically this kind of a uh, 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 constraint to resolve this. So future growth depends on, and this I like how they put it, really. It depends on continued progress toward state and institution building. And then they also mentioned that the development of partners should be a big part of that. Thank you, that is extremely important. Now, general comments. The study has almost all the ingredients of a great study. And it answered these three questions. So yes, we can believe it. We learned a lot 
and we can believe what is going on. They have used a lot of uh, quantitative measures. Uh, they use it, in fact, some common and easy to access statistics and analytics like descriptive statistics, correlations, graphs, they use all those kind of things. So it is believable. Their recommendations are well thought of. I like it, big tables uh, that Natasha tried to put in there. And, um, and also, but also I like it, the emphasis that they put on uh, concerns for women and youth. And especially I like some of these statements, they're very, very courageous, especially how men are basically keeping all the productive activity for themselves, how women are not being given. And, uh, and I also like it how they talk about uh, uh, the Ayuto, which was basically, uh, uh, some, some Somalis call it, I think, uh, Ayuto or what was the uh, other, other Hegbed, yeah, which basically women are trying to accumulate some capital so they can, in fact, take the boats and fish, go for fish, uh, instead of just selling the fish in downtown Bosaso or downtown uh, 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 Mogadishu when somebody else who is making a lot of money catches it. I didn't see any typos or anything of that sort. It is very well done. Uh, it could have been improved if uh, uh, the data collection was expanded a little bit. Some of the areas they couldn't go, for example, Somali Lambert was a little bit stale. It was 2012, so it was a little bit too old. Uh, the Bosaso and the, and, uh, is great. I like that I found the transportation data very, very useful. And in fact, very interesting how they even talk about the taxation, uh, some of the money that, uh, for example, uh, al shawab are charging, other things, that, that was very, very interesting. So in many ways, there were not too many surprises. So some people may say, so what? Question could be raised. But I say it is still extremely important because we're not only talking to Somalis, we are also talking to the rest of the world as well. And a more general study like this one is also very, very useful to get some support for those projects. So I uh, will stop sharing and basically end it there. Thank you very much. I may have taken a little bit more time then. Uh, <laughs> so sorry for doing that. Yeah. No, no, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hussein. Um, it was a pleasure to listen to you um, and thank you for your breakdown. Um, so I'll leave it at that and then I'll, I'll bring Asta in. So just to introduce uh, Asta um, briefly. Um, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Excellent. Perfect. Um, Asta Bereset, I hope that I'm saying the name right, is a senior private sector specialist in the World Bank Group, uh, World Bank Finance Competitive and Innovative Global Practice, East Africa Unit. Asta's work is focused on strengthening the business environment, fostering MSME development and supporting women entrepreneurship. Asta holds a bachelor's degree from the University of Oxford and a dual master degree from Columbia University. Uh, Columbia University School of International Public Affairs and Haiti School of Governance. Um, Asta, please come in. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I really appreciate the opportunity to be part of the discussion today um, and, and to follow such, such great speakers. So I will also try to be very quick given that our time is limited. And, and first of all, uh, just to follow the introduction. So I, I wanted to emphasize that my work at the World Bank comes from the more operational side and, and I work and, and lead private sector and financial sector development projects uh, to support uh, the, the government of Somalia um, in, in their efforts to, to create um, private sector driven growth in, in Somalia. Um, so I, I again would like to maybe uh, divide my comments into, into two parts. And first of all, I think as Natasha and, 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 and uh, Mr. Hussein uh, highlighted very clearly, private sector has a really critical role in Somalia to drive jobs and economic transformation. And with this regard, um, in, in my first section of, of the comments, I just wanted to highlight some of the areas that already came out in, in Natasha's report, but also comes very strongly in our dialogue with the government and the private sector in Somalia 
area to really create strong enabling environment and, and facilitate um, uh, growth of, of firms across different sectors. So through the operational work that, that we are doing in Somalia, um, we really want to focus on, on three areas. Um, and, and one of them, and, and, and the cross-cutting one, is, is working on the enabling environment. This is here to address the legal, regulatory, institutional, maybe shortages that are preventing from Somalia um, catching, catching up with some of its peers. And, and here I would highlight efforts to strengthen the financial sector reforms, strengthening the macroeconomic stability, as well as uh, some of the posts really targeting the private sector, including business registration re reforms, uh, competition policy to enable um, equal playing ground as as well as reforms to facilitate access to finance land and other critical um, inputs uh, secondly what what we see as a as a key priority is is uh, sector level interventions and as natasha highlighted um, a lot of knowledge is still coming out in this regard on what we know and what we don't know about the performance of different sectors and what specific constraints need to be addressed in each of those sectors so we very much welcome this report and also the dialogue that, that we're having with the private sector representatives to deep dive uh, to uh, dive deeper to understand those challenges and then working together with the government to design interventions that would help address those specific sector um, constraints, services sector being one of them, as well as um, agribusiness and, and beyond that. Um, maybe to mention digital sector also emerging as a very promising sector in Somalia. And lastly, um, going down to the firm level and, and what can and be then to really uh, design interventions to foster MSME growth. Uh, here again, focusing on micro, small, and medium enterprises, but but some of these interventions would also benefit large businesses. And what we we've, we've seen works in other countries, and and what we're trying to apply in Somalia as well are those interventions that would help strengthen firm capabilities to upskill, upgrade their technologies, also facilitate their access to finance, um, access to markets, and 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 beyond. So really, just to summarize, looking at it through three levels, at the cross-cutting, enabling environment level, looking at the sector level interventions, and then um, firm, firm level support. Um, what, one thing I didn't mention also is, of course, providing market infrastructure. So that comes again to financial market infrastructure, be it in the financial sector, such as uh, creating collateral registries, um, credit bureaus, and so on. All of that currently are lacking in, in Somalia, as well as other areas, including logistics, um, quality infrastructure. And again, I, 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 I can go in more detail when we come to the discussion, but I just wanted to acknowledge the importance of, of market infrastructure. So that was the, the first bucket of my comments. And I think what, what today we wanted to focus a lot also was on women and entrepreneurs. Uh, Natasha's report highlighted, um, Natasha's presentation highlighted a lot of additional challenges that uh, female-led enterprises are, are, are facing. And indeed, whilst I guess we recognize already that private sector conditions are one of the toughest in, in Somalia, then when we look at women entrepreneurs, there is the whole layer of additional constraints that they need to tackle and that again we want to help with our interventions uh, to facilitate so, so so for example i again wanted to start with kind of laws regulations and social norms and just highlight another report which is not being discussed here today but that came out last year which looks at uh, it's called women business and, and law and it looks at a number of different economies looking at different constraints that female entrepreneurs are facing and and just to say that again when when we look at somalia somalia is ranking behind its peers in, in sub-Saharan Africa. So tackling, tackling those challenges at, at, at the legal regulatory uh, framework, as well as the social law norms, whilst recognizing that it takes time, really remains a, a priority. But lastly, going back to, um, to the interventions in, in particular, we also need to be very mindful that approaches that, that we apply economy-wide might not be enough to reach women entrepreneurs. And that's why we need to tailor those interventions and, and see what can be done to really um, uh, alleviate um, 
the challenges women women in business are, are facing. So I just wanted to provide two examples. When it comes to access to finance, we do know that again, the, it's it's a big banks in, in, in Somalia and, and microfinance institutions are already serving just a very small uh, portion of the needs that businesses are facing. And then when it comes to reaching women entrepreneurs, that becomes even more challenging, especially due to a number of, of constraints such as high collateral requirements. So what, what we have has worked in other countries and, and what I think we can explore more is bringing more innovative approaches, for example, by uh, uh, applying psychometro testing instead of more, um, uh, more conventional credit um, Credit, credit scoring approaches, also taking into account cash flow techniques to, to again help address the, the collateral issues is something that has worked in neighboring countries and that I think would work very well in Somalia um, as well. Um, Secondly, is, is skills development. And again, what, what we do know that just business development services um, in, in a traditional way might not be enough. What is really needed when we come to women entrepreneurs is to complement the, the, what, what I refer to as more traditional business uh, development services, such as you know, preparation of business plans, uh, financial uh, accounting, and so on, with more um, psychosocial skills as, as well, and, and looking how to build women's confidence, how to really build leadership skills, and, and, and create some mind shift shifts among the uh, women who might be really uh, if, if provided with the right support flourishing in, in the business community. So again, there are a lot of um, interesting pilots being done across the world and, and, and something that we can certainly explore more in the Somali context. Um, I will stop here in the interest of time, but thanks again for the opportunity and look forward to the discussion. Thanks. Uh, thank you so much, Asta, for taking the conversation a bit forward on entrepreneurship and financing and um, I'll just bring Asta in now. Um, I mean, I'll bring uh, Jan. Um, I'd like to introduce Jan von der Goltz, um, who is an economist in the Jobs Group and is leading the group's engagement in situations affected by fragility, conflict, and violence. Much of this work has focused on fragile economies from the Sahel across to the Horn of Africa. Jan holds a PhD in development economics uh, from Columbia University. Please, Dr. Jan. Please come in. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. And uh, it, it is a great, great honor and pleasure to be here today. Um, I've, I've enjoyed working on the report with, with Natasha, but uh, due to COVID, we've, we've had so few opportunities to, to discuss uh, and to meet. So it's, it's a special pleasure to be here. Um, as, uh, as we've just heard, I've been leading the work on fragility, conflict and violence in the jobs group for the past couple of years. So uh, Natasha asked me to um, provide a brief perspective on what we think has worked in supporting jobs um, in, in other settings that have to, to deal with fragility. And I'll just try to offer some, some very brief uh, reflections on that and hope we have a chance to, to discuss further and go into detail. Um, so, so high level lessons, uh, let, me, let me offer three. So one is in a, in a recovery situation, Everybody hopes for a peace dividend. Everybody would like to see one of these quick turnarounds where you know, there's a lot of reform, there is a lot of dynamism and things really change. We hope for that, but it's realistic to say it's the exception rather than the rule. It's happened sometimes, but it doesn't generally happen. But what is more likely to happen is kind of a gradual improvement. And I think it's important to keep in mind that gradual improvements can make a real difference in the working lives of people and in their ability to, to, to access jobs. And let me give two examples of where we've seen that in, in our work. Um, so in thinking about the impact of insecurity on business, um, in an analysis that we did in central Mali, um, people were dealing with situations where it was hard, for instance, for artisans to go from towns to villages to do repairs, for instance, mechanical repairs or do construction work. At the same time, difficult for farmers to bring products uh, to the markets in town. But the degree to which this is possible matters. So whether I am really limited to staying in my town or whether there are some parts of the surrounding areas that I can visit and from which farmers can come makes a very big difference um, in their productivity. So 
let's not be discouraged if situations don't change as rapidly as we would like. Gradual progress can really make a difference. Um, similarly, in macroeconomic management, um, for instance, in inflation management in a country like South Sudan, coming even from inflation rates of, let's say, 80 to 100 percent per year to still very elevated rates of 20 to 30 percent uh, per year made a very big difference for businesses. So these step-by-step -step processes, even if they're not perfect, um, matter and are helpful. Secondly, um, a reminder that while we, we tend to think about the side of the entrepreneur and what can work better in their business, it's important not to forget about market demand. And it was striking to me that the very first quote that Natasha showed from the qualitative work was actually um, a businesswoman explaining that it is sometimes hard to find customers in the market. And that's very typical in a setting that's affected by, by displacement and um, by ongoing insecurity. Purchasing power has been eroded um, and that makes for a more risky business environment for anybody who is trying to run their own activity. If I make an investment, if I try to take things to the market, am I actually going to be able to sell it? Uh, am I going to find customers? So uh, it's just, uh, I think, important not to forget about that. Regrettably, our models for trying to address that are not as strong as they are on the businesses side, but there are some entry points and crucial one, of course, is trade. And Natasha has talked about that. Um, others are to think about what levers government policy has in trying to revive purchasing power in the market. And the third point um, that, that may sound a bit obvious, but I think it's very important to, to, to keep in mind is to be realistic about what a job is for most people in the economy. Um, and in Somalia, like in so, so many other countries that have to uh, struggle with insecurity, it's really self-employment that provides most jobs. And the big challenge for the day, for today, is low productivity. So it's to go from these 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 two dollars a day that Professor Varsame has alluded to, to you know maybe even five or six dollars a day, which is still very low, but it's a very different life um, for for people who are able to to draw upon that that revenue. So in terms of ways to support jobs, I would like to say there are I think two conclusions um, from when we when we are realistic about what jobs are today. One is for youth who are self-employed, one immediate concern really is access to funding. Uh, we've heard that that's particularly difficult for women who are often the last ones to be able to access family funds or funds from the wider network. Um, but it's a general challenge for youth who are looking to set up their activity. It is probably not technical skills today. Again, that may matter in the future when there's a recovery in wage work. Um, but generally, when we're starting out, there just isn't enough demand for people who have these kind of skills. On the other hand, um, Asta has already alluded to what we like to call psychosocial skills. So that's often about confidence. It's about planning. It's about patience. Um, it's about skills in interacting with customers. There are some, some positive experiences there. And I think the, the other point when we think about supporting these young people who are trying to make a living um, with funding, it's sometimes about simplicity. Um, there are people who are able to, to work with microfinance institutions or to work with other kind of former lenders, but for some that can be a real stretch. Uh, going for in, in a difficult business environment where I have few resources, where there's risk everywhere to taking a loan can be quite difficult. So I do think it's worth thinking about uh, grant funding uh, for, for young people who are in, in these kind of uh, situations. And just uh, to close on a thought about the high, the high hiring rates uh, in some of the, the established businesses that Natasha has reported on. And, and I really thought it, it's an interesting thought from Professor Warsame whether this is catch up growth and it will slow down. But still, it's, it is nice to see. It is good to see this kind of growth rate uh, that is, is above, above other countries. And although the base is very small and it's not going to provide that many jobs at the moment relative to where the economy is, I think we should think about how these dynamic businesses can help jobs growth in the wider economy. And I think we need to think about linkages. Are there businesses um, that link with other activities in the economy, for instance, in the livestock sector or in, in fisheries? And are there ways to support these specific um, value chains? So I'll stop there and look forward to the discussion. Thank you.
Uh, thank you so much for your insight. Um, I'll now bring in uh, Mr. Jibril Hassan Mohammed, who is the chairman of, the, of Premier Bank. As chair, the main responsibility um, is his main responsibility is to ensure that the corporate governance and stewardship of the bank is conducted in an ethical and transparent manner. Jibril also guides the board on overseeing strategy policy, uh, investor relationships, key partnerships within the bank. Jibril also holds a master's um in business administration from the minnesota school of business and a global banking program from the columbia university in new york um jibril sorry you had trouble coming in initially but um uh, please please come in when you're ready uh, hi everyone i hope i can be heard so thank you so much and i really acknowledge the amount of time and effort that has been put together for such a very useful report to be prepared, and I think that uh, the report talk, talks about mostly on the employment and jobs, you know, creation issues related to Somalia. And I also believe that the problems of, you know, job creation issues in Somalia are even more than than those who are mentioned in the report. Even though the report involves, you know, a date that is many years ago. And that Somalia, the situation is actually changing you know, dramatically every day and every month. But it also shows that, you know, that the, the problem is there, that most of it, you know, has been mentioned in the report. And I personally believe that actually the employment issues in Somalia are way far, you know, severe than those mentioned in the report. I have been involved in Somalia for many years, since the last, you know, several years, and I've seen that one of the main issues in Somalia is that when we talk about employment, then there's, there should be opportunity of employment. So we have seen that there is lack of, you know, of opportunity employment in Somalia. Uh, we have seen that uh, many are graduating yearly from the schools and universities, and that also contributed to the issues of employment in Somalia. Uh, it seems that there's no balance between graduation and also employment opportunity in the country. So, which also brought that the high graduation, you know, ratios in the country is also making part of the, you know, uh, employment problem where we have seen many of them are expecting, you know, high salary than what's available in the market. Uh, the other problem we have seen in Somalia that also affects you know, this topic that the report talks about is the lack of merit-based recruitment processes in Somalia. And that is one of the biggest problems that actually, you know, uh, the report mentioned it. And I do believe that it exists in the country more than in the way that's already mentioned in the report. Uh, when we talk about employment, I remember when we thought about opening this premier bank in Somalia, we have assigned a company in Kenya, uh, actually it was a consulting firm to help us recruit the first 50 people whom we employed in the country. And I remember that we did our best to make the most possible merit-based recruitment process in that process. And we have assigned it non-Somalis to really be part of that recruitment. We wanted, you know, 50 people and in less than 24 hours, we have received a thousand requests. So that shows you that for every one position that you need, you know, minimum 15 or 20 people, you know, are requesting in less than uh, 24 hours. Uh, less, actually not, uh, it was, we wanted 50 people and we have received more than a thousand uh, requests of, of, of employment in less than 24 hours until we have to close, you know, that window of, of, of receiving more applications. Uh, we also wanted to balance the gender-based recruitment and we instructed, you know, uh, that farm to make sure that at least the 40 to 60 employment ratio between the gender basis, but we have seen that less women or less, you know, gender basis have, you know, applied those vacancies, which, you know, when we try to get more info about why, it was that 
you know, it's something based on the graduation level also that is based on the gender also that graduated from the universities. Uh, we have seen that the reason for the unemployment also in the country is, uh, if you talk about there are, you know, categories that are very essential of the job creation in any country, not only in Somalia, but in any country. Uh, the reason is or the problems we have seen in Somalia that have, has more effect on those categories are lack of proper electric power supply, uh, the small industries are not available in the country, which are very essential, you know, in the job creation of the country. We have seen a poor quality of education that thousands of people are, you know, graduating from the schools every year, but the level of education they are given also does not make them to qualify a very highly, you know, uh, skill-based position is, we have seen negligence in the essential areas like agriculture, fishing, and other natural resources in the country, uh, which if actually a very limited effort could have been spared on those natural, you know, resources areas in the country, it could have created, you know, thousands and thousands of, 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 of jobs, you know, in the country. Uh, we have seen the corruption also is another big, you know, player in, 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 in the job creation. Uh, where in reports from different institutions, we see that there are thousands of ghosts employment or employees in the government where nobody knows whether they are existing or not. Uh, the reports talk about the access to financing that is also limiting the job employment or creation of employment where, you know, it's an area that I'm very, you know, accessible to it or I have more information of it. Uh, there are financial institutions, even though the capacity of the financial institutions we have in the country are very limited, but the rules and the regulation is all of the country is very weak. The central bank is not still in a position to impose or to enforce, you know, those, those policies, you know, that contribute to the job creation. Uh, we have seen that banks are actually demanding a high value collateral for small, you know, uh, loan requirement. I have had a situation of one of my visits, you know, in the bank that I was attending the, one of the committees and try to understand more about, you know, lending and the procedures of, you know, lending to the people. And I've seen that a graduate student from one of the universities requested a $10,000 loan and has been asked to provide a land collateral for that 10,000, which I ask it, the guys in the bank, if this guy has a land that has a value of more than $10,000, he should have sold this land and get that money and do his business. But because he's coming to the bank, he doesn't have anything. He doesn't have any collateral to put for him to get this loan. So what other option is open for him to get this loan? And the answer was no other option at all. And when I ask it why, is that they also have their own problems, which uh, they have their own policy that the total money they have, they only lend 30% of it. The total deposits they have, they only lend 30% of it, which is a big problem to the job creation in the country because banks are supposed to lend the money they have, not to put in the, you know, in the savings. And the reason that they do that is because they cannot manage there be any shock. There is no last resort lender, which all these things, you know, are the government responsibility that are, you know, lacking in the, in the, in the, in the, in the industry. So you can imagine if the bank that I am full aware of is holding the total, you know, money they have more than, you know, half of it or 70% of it, they are not lending. You can imagine the other banks. Banks, you know, if you go to any region, in many countries, around 95 or 96 percent are allowed, you know, bank to lend, and because they can manage the shocks, because they have a strong central bank, because they they have the last last resort lender, uh, lender, for all those things, you know, it gives the opportunity, you know, the bank is to do lend more and more and more. But because of Somalia, the situation is very different, and that is also affecting the employment opportunity in Somalia, which. I hope there should be a very quick change in this. Uh, the report. Hello. Ah. 
the report talk about the regional integration. As of now, in my belief, there's no balancing in the regional integration between Somalia and the other East African countries. It's also having, you know, an effect that Somalia is not free to export to whatever they could do in Somalia to the neighboring countries. The report talk about the cross-border relationships and this, you know, effect on the jobs and employment of, 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 of the economic, you know, development of the country. This is also an area that I have worked on it very much in the last few years. And I can say that I have flown more than 350 hours just to looking for a cross-border relationship for, 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 for the bank I work for. And with the limited experience I have had initially, I tried to solve this problem of the cross-border relationship with my bank. But finally, I have realized that this problem only a government can solve it, not, you know, a private entity or an individual can solve it. Uh, the report has talked about investing in human capital. Human capital is very important for every country and it needs a very visionary leaders and a government in Somalia, which I don't see now or I don't foresee it, but we still hope that we encounter those visionary leaders, you know, to make sure that they invest in the human capital of the country. Uh, we have seen lack of policies in the country, reforms in competition policies in every, you know, sector policy that also hinders the economic development and the creation of jobs in the country. All those are, you know, affecting directly to the topic the report I've talked about. And I really commend it for those who have been involved in, you know, to prepare in this report. Even though the report was not supposed to, you know, to be not more than two or three years age, but it also, you know, gives a very uh, in-depth, you know, information about the economic situation in Somalia. Uh, we hope that many of those challenges mentioned in the report could have changed or may change in the near future. And the question that since a new government is, you know, about to be you know, to come on board, what changes or what expectations we have or we are expecting from that government. We do hope that they should be able to do a very good job in the country, but because of the current problem is, I don't think they will even get a time to bring a new opportunity to the country, but if they could be able to manage, you know, to solve in the current problem is we have, that would be a very good thing. In any way, I am commending for those who are involved in the preparation of this report, I've been given a very long, very short notice. I should not be able to prepare or, you know, do a research on the topic or read the whole report to able to contribute much better than I am now. But I also, you know, admit that a good effort has been given to prepare in this report. And thank you, everyone, and thank you for, the, for your time. Thank you so much. Uh Thank you very much, Jibril. Um, it was still very insightful, and and thank you for the breakdown of um, of how all this comes together for you and and in the job that you are doing. Um, finally, I'll bring in Awais, um, our very own Dr. Awais, and then um, we can now move on to the Q and A uh, section of the forum. Dr. Awais Ali is a senior researcher and economist at the Heritage Institute. He has a PhD in economics and his primary research areas include economics, human capital development, institutional quality, uh, poverty reduction, education and environment. He has written numerous publications in, in peer reviewed journals and uh, policy papers. And he has um, delivered um, very many presentations, both nationally and internationally um, on, on various topics. Um, Dr. Ways, come in, please, when you're ready. Uh, thank you very much, Yasmin. And thank you very much for the World Bank team and other panelists to deliberate this uh, timely discussion on Somali's growth promotion and job agenda. I think this is very important discussion. And I, of course, I would like to thank the, the panelists and also the presentation from the World Bank. I think this is a really very big issue for Somalia, uh, even though that our policymakers are busy on politics and and other, you know, and, and unreal issues. And we're very happy to facilitate this discussion with the private sector and other relevant uh, government agencies. And, and I think this kind of discussion will really contribute to the, to the Somalis uh, 
you know, uh, state building process and economic development. And of course, the panelist has just mentioned a number of really very important discussion. The presentation is really also very important. And I think this uh, policy prescription is that uh, the World Bank produces will be very, very, very con important contribution to Somali's uh, economic development. But when we're talking about, of course, uh, economic development and job creation, we have to also look at, the, at the, what are the key challenges, especially and economic structural challenges. We're talking about the economic growth for the last few years. We are seeing the Somalia is showing uh, progress in terms of economic development. We're talking about the percentage of uh, GDP at 3.2% before the coronavirus came in Somalia. And, and I think it's very, very, very important to look at the growth dynamics of Somalia. And our, our agricultural sector is our mainstay, but we are seeing that uh, the climate change is really devastating. A lot of people, a lot of people are really, you know, uh, displacing from these uh, sectors to more urbanized areas. And we're losing, of course, our mainstay and of our economy in Somalia. So when we're talking about jobs, we have to also think about what are the sectors that can really and produce a lot of opportunities for young people, especially women. And the, we, we are actually uh, publishing a new report on youth unemployment in Somalia in the next week, probably. And I think uh, what we found is really very surprising, even though a lot of young people are really have no access to employment opportunities. And, you know, it's surprising to see the young people preference on job creation is, is really, uh, you know, self-employment, a lot of people are seeing that if you look at the statistics, 84% of young people are preferred uh, for self-employment. And this is due to the fact that, uh, of course, uh, uh, we're talking about government failure, we're talking about uh, because of our public sector cannot produce or provide employment opportunities because of fiscal space challenges. We're talking about private sectors, even though it's doing well when it comes to employment uh, you know, creation, but it's not enough to really address those young uh, population in Somalia. So what we found is uh, what are the impediments of those uh, young people in terms of access to, uh, to employment? And they raised that nepotism is really a big issue because we're talking about uh, bad governance. People really say that if you really want to get a job, you have to have a connection with the government officials or whether you have a clan relative in the government or in the private sector to, to be employed. And this really should be addressed in terms of uh, providing, you know, a discriminative uh, practice policy uh, to address uh, those uh, corruption and, and nepotism. We also found that a lack of education, of course, my colleagues just mentioned that human capital deficiency. We also have done a report on this in 2020. And we found that, of course, a lot of young people in Somalia could not have access to education and employment. So coming up with the, with the discussion, and Natasha just mentioned, that and entrepreneurship is uh, really uh, driving our economy. We, we're seeing people are shifting from agricultural sector because if you see the statistics in, in, in three years back, employment creation was really uh, concentrated on agriculture and livestock, but now people are shifting to a small and service sector and entrepreneurship. But there's also other challenges when it comes to entrepreneurship. Do we have the capacity in terms of, uh, you know, providing uh, skill development, in terms of providing access? Because when you talk about entrepreneurship, we have to have the capacity to really come up with innovative ideas, come up with uh, access to financing. Of course, you really just mentioned now, and access to financing is a big challenge. But of course, for example, if the World Bank and IMF provide uh, financial support uh, to, to, to Somalia, do we have the institutional mechanisms? And when we talk about institutions, I'm not talking about, of course, the physical. We have, of course, the Ministry of Labor, we have a Gergara facility, and, and a program, we have also a Ministry of Financing, but we're talking about do we have the capacity to really take those initiatives to more actionable or programming activities. So I think there's an issue of institutional deficiency. Unless we address those issues, I think it will be a very long time to, to really uh, provide a productive and sustainable employment. And also when we're talking about, of course, job creation, our private sector is main state of our economy. But uh, of course, the responsible private sector should also expand uh, their economic activities and provide a new sectors that can really accommodate those grown young people, especially, for example, if you come up with, uh, you know, industries that can really, you know, accommodate those people. And, and of course, the government role is also very important in providing policy directions, for example, like industrial policy, where we can really 
you know, have a direction is on considerations on, 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 on creating in those industries. And I think we, we also talk about in, in terms of uh, enabling environment. Of, of course, security is a big issue in Somalia. A lot of people are really concerned about the security and instability in Somalia. So if you want to attract, for example, uh, foreign direct investment, we also have to address those in, uh, enabling environment issues. For example, we have to establish the country. We have to come up with regulatory issues that can really facilitate those investments from outside. Because foreign direct investment is, is really a great equalizer to create jobs and also economic growth. And I would like to emphasize and policy alone is not really enough. We, we're talking about, of course, providing evidence-based policy, but we also to be supplemented with supportive environment, including addressing uh, that I mentioned discriminative practices as well as providing access to educational opportunities. I think it's time for the ne next government to prioritize because we're talking about prioritization in terms of structure creation. People are busy on day-to-day -day -day politics, but of course, providing opportunities for young people will have really a good, a good implication for, for, for security and stability of the country. What we found in our study is that and young people are really a fertile ground for conflict and other, you know, and, 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 and extremism ideologies because of lack of employment opportunity, lack of uh, livelihood, and lack of education. And I would like to thank again for, for the panelists. Uh, I have to make it short. And I'm looking forward to the other discussions with the participants. And I would like to thank the World Bank as well as the other panelists. Thank you very much. Yasmin, over to you. Thank you so much. Um, I'll, uh, thank you for, for all your insights. Uh, I'll just move straight to the Q&A because we're really, really out of time. Um, Natasha, there is a question directed at you that, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if you're able to answer it live um, on the Q&A box. So there is uh, Mohammed Yusuf um, who says, thank you for the enlightening talk. Natasha I had a couple of questions uh, in your talk and report you focus quite a bit on entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship is related to socioeconomic factors such as education and financial resources. Uh, how can we encourage individuals in Somalia to pursue entrepreneurship when, when there is scarcity in education and finance resources? And then, um, and so I'll read the first one, but I'll, I'll let you respond to both of them because there's two questions, yeah? Okay, great, Th thanks so much. I, I just, I would just first like to start off by thank you, thanking the panelists. I've really enjoyed your interventions and, I hope that we can continue to collaborate like this. It's, it's really enlightening actually to hear your reflections and, and your views um, on the report. There have, I, before I dive into this question, there have been some other questions and comments on how old the data is that we use. So as we all know in Somalia, um, there's a big problem with data scarcity but you have to work with what you have. So we didn't just use the Somaliland 2012 report. We also used three other reports, which are much more recently produced. And we compared and contrasted the findings between each of these different reports. Because data is sometimes generated in a piecemeal way, or there are some parts of the country which were missed out, what we, what we did is we used all available quantitative data to put together a coherent storyline. Nevertheless, I really um, take on board the comment from Jabril that things in the economy change on a day-to-day -day basis and on a, on a month by month basis. And that's because the Somali economy is, is, really, um, is really dynamic and, and we recognize that. Um, and I also want to mention that we're in the mid middle of um, collecting data for a new survey. And so in about six months time, we should have new data on employment and new data on household consumption. And I think this will provide uh, a different insights, um, which, we, which we can come back and share with you as well. Okay, so on this question of, of entrepreneurship, it's, I would say it's less about encouraging entrepreneurship because what we found was that entrepreneurship is existing, it's already happening. And, and part of this is because there's a, a lack of formal wage opportun opportunities, but it's also because there's, there's this proud tradition of entrepreneurship. We heard from people who would tell us that actually they prefer to be entrepreneurs because it gives them more flexibility. They're able to grow, they can, um, you know, they can innovate, innovate and try new approaches. So I think entrepreneurship already exists. 
The issue is how to make entrepreneurship more productive. And as you mentioned here in your comments, and these are the comments that, that the constraints that our report also brought out, there's a real challenge related to access to finance and, and education. So in terms of access to finance, we've provided some recommendations in the report. We know, for example, that um, the reasons why banks can't lend to, to some female entrepreneurs is because of risk perceptions. So how do you address these types of risk perceptions? What could be alternatives? I mean, we heard about this land collateral that our colleague um, from the Premier Bank was, was mentioning. And these are real, real, real challenges. And I think developing, and, and I, I think my, my colleague Asta could probably um, elaborate on this more, but developing um, a pipeline of bankable, um, micro and um, small and medium-sized um, enterprises with, with bankable projects could be a good starting point. And having access to grant financing could be a, a, a good starting point. And, and then this question of privatization of the education sector. So the advice from our education colleagues is that we already have um, a sector which is which is very much privatized. We have all sorts of non-state actors involved in service provision, but the problem is that there's a total lack of regulation. So it means that quality is really uneven. And unless you, cannot, unless you um, can pay, you can't have access to, to a decent education. And that just leaves out such a huge portion of the population. So what, what our education colleagues um, suggest is actually working in partnership with these non-state act actors and for the federal government to develop um, stewardship and um, uh, to have a stewardship role and to, uh, to support the regulation of this sector, which will come over time. Um, and then also just going back to this issue of access to finance and, and another colleague that, uh, another comment that Jabril brought up on this correspondent banking relationships and actually the, the huge role that the government has to play here I would wholeheartedly agree with Jabril. There are some aspects related to um, governance reforms where, where the Somali government authorities are working and they can continue working. And this can help to integrate Somalia in the global financial system, which can encourage access to international financial flows. Um, some of the other questions on high energy costs and high taxes of products, you know, we completely agree. These are, these are the challenges that we've brought out in the report. When we look at the data, we actually see that the, the cost of energy supply in Somalia is much higher than, uh, than the Horn of Africa, because at the moment, what you have is a system where there are these oligopolistic mini grids, which are, which are in operation. And um, there are very high levels of losses, um, and this all contributes to higher costs for the consumers. But things are changing. There are investments going on in the energy sector. Uh, a lot of these investments are focused on renewable energy. And Somalia here has a huge comparative advantage with the coastline, the wind power, the solar power generation. It's amongst the highest in the continent. So there are investments in place. I think that if there are the enabling conditions, to facilitate these investments, the potential is, is really is, is, is huge. Um, yes, doing business in Somalia is very challenging in these, in these challenging solutions. I mean, I, I couldn't agree more with this comment. We've put, you know, in our report, we've identified some of the solutions um, which draw from this women business and the law report. Uh, we know that Somalia enacted the company law in 2019, but there's a gap in implementation. We need more public-private dialogue. We know that the private sector is dynamic, but there's not the regulations to support business. All the regulations are being implemented very, very gradually. This reform will take time. You know, I want to hear your ideas on how some of these um, solutions can be overcome. What do you think is important? Um, Okay, I see there's a, there's a question here to Dr. Hussain. And again, I think this goes back to the, the role of the central bank. And, and actually, the central bank um, can play a huge role in, the, in, in developing a national risk assessment to support the access to corresponding uh, correspondent banking relationships. Um, 
Okay, then there are many questions on the financial sector. I think I would leave those to Asta and perhaps hand over to my to my colleague um, and distinguished panel uh, member, um, Dr. Hussein. But before doing so, Yasmin, I hand over back to you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much. Um, we, I know we have one raised hand, Abdinasir Sagar. Um, I'll urge you to keep your hand there, and then I'll bring in uh, Dr. Orsame, and then I'll come back to you, Abdinasir. Um, so we can we can finally close this off. Uh, thank you, Yasmin. So basically, you want me to answer the central bank one, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, first of all. Uh, I mean, the reason why I think Mohammed is asking that question is because I am also in the board of directors of the Central Bank of Somalia. And yes, as you do know, the Central Bank of Somalia, of course, ceased to exist in 1991. So since 2009, we were trying to revive it. Since 2012, it has actually reached a level where we can say now it is able to be uh, basically the bank of the government in the sense that it's basically, basically uh, that's most of the activities of the government. It is also now trying to, uh, and in fact, it does uh, at least regulate the financial sector. So it is uh, regulating at least the uh, 11, uh, 13 banks and quite a bit, I think it's 12 uh, uh, remittance agencies. And uh, we're now going into mobile money. So we are actually um, uh, now uh, regulating at least the big two uh, carriers. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and we are trying to uh, do a little bit more in that sector. Uh, we haven't printed money. It will come probably, but we have to think very, very hard before we do that and all the mechanisms. But uh, I would say, Given the uh, given the growth that the bank made for the last, let us say, five to six years, it will be in a position to do that, to do quite a bit about the employment as well, and, and all those things could be, uh, I, I would say. But uh, right now, we don't have the capitalization to do that because there has to be capitalization and we are actually getting a lot of help from the from the IMF we're getting a lot of help from World Bank but probably uh, the chairman of the board who is also the governor could say a little bit more sometime in the future but uh, they we are doing a lot and expect a lot from us in the coming few years for the first time we got clean audit this year for the first time clean audit means unqualified opinion I am uh, the chair of the audit committee, so I am aware of that. We work very, very hard for the last two years. We reached that. And since now we are clean, we can only add to that in the future. So I will stop there. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Osame. I know Asta, you wanted to come in to add to what Natasha said. So I'll give you maybe a minute or two, and then I'll, I'll bring in the, the question. Thank you. Thank you so much. And again, I'll, I'll try to be very brief and, and just wanted to add a little bit to what Natasha and, and the last speaker was, was saying exactly. I think access to finance and all of these discussions that we have been having comes up over and over as one of the biggest concerns um, and, and limitations for the private sector in Somalia. And, and in that regard, I think a lot is being done already, but much more can and, and should be done. And also there is a lot of learning by doing. So for example, one of the projects, the world, one of the um, initiatives the World Bank project is supporting is the new Gargara MSME financing facility, which is working with financial institutions in Somalia to extend their offering to businesses in Somalia. But, but what we have seen that providing capital is not enough. More needs to be done, both on the supply and demand side, including building the capacity of financial institutions to reach this more unknown uh, segments in, in the productive sectors, women-led enterprises, and, and so on. And like 
likewise on the demand side, what the banks are facing is that the businesses coming to the, to them do not have the the skills to prepare a strong business proposal to make you know a, a good case for investments, and and that's why what we see in Somalia is that whilst banks have a lot of capital, most of it these days is still flowing to trade financing instead of um, financing investments and and productive activities. So so again, just wanted to to highlight that that a lot of experimentation is, is taking place and also bringing practices from other countries. So for example, risk sharing mechanism, capacity building to financial institutions, as well as demand on, and interventions on, on the demand side. Um, I also wanted to echo uh, Professor Warsame on the financial sector reforms that indeed Somalia starting from, from, from a very low base has, has, has been uh, has done a tremendous progress across a number of areas. But as Natasha said, it takes time and, and any reform needs to be also accepted and, and implemented by the private sector. Implementation requires a lot of public-private dialogue. And just to mention some of these initiatives that the Central Bank has been working on, uh, including the national payment system that was launched um, just a few months ago, uh, the work done to license mobile money operators and continued efforts to strengthen know your customer um, mechanisms in Somalia, especially whilst the country is still working towards implementing the digital ID project. So all of this requires time, requires dialogue, and, and that's why venues like today's event, but also any other uh, forums that can bring together different st stakeholders are, are so critical, and, and hopefully step by step, uh, more, more can be done across all of these areas. So let me stop here, I know we're out of time. Uh, thank you so much, Asta. No, um, that was very insightful. Um, I'll allow uh, Abdinasir Sagar to ask the question or to. Um... Yes, can you hear me now? Uh, yes, we can hear you. No, thank you very much for this very informative session today. I, I learned a lot, and I think uh, a lot of the findings in the report that were discussed today, I think is something important for, for policymakers. In particular, I think the access to finance, the transportation challenges, and the others that were, were talked about. I have a brief question, and maybe this is addressed in the report, which I haven't uh, reviewed in detail, but we have, I think, observed, especially in Somalia, the increased reliance on mobile banking and the use of mobile payment systems. So I was wondering how does this trend sort of impact small businesses, in particular, you know, uh, you know, women that the, the, the group has uh, discussed in detail, how does it impact them and their productivity? Uh, does it uh, impact it positively or negatively? And then do you think, you know, these entrepreneurs and these traders have the right digital skill to sort of navigate uh, this? And then finally, another question, I know in the report, you talked about the, the issue with this mobile payment systems in that they are the currency that they use is mostly US dollar and is not a Somali shilling. Do you think in the long term that's going to have an impact also on this, in the economy of Somalia? Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you so much, Abdinasir. Those are great questions. Um, Jibril, you have your hand up. Um, did you want to respond to something? Uh, yes. I just wanted to raise uh, and respond to the central bank directly. We talk about that access to finance is a real challenge of economic development in Somalia and banks in Somalia actually are not, even though they claim they are Islamic banks, but for me, I have not seen the signs of being an Islamic bank. Uh, the bank, you know, is supposed to be the money creator in global, you know, the government creators, you know, little portion of the money circulating in the, in, the, in the market, but the rest of the money is created by the bank through loans, you know, and, and access to finance to the people who need. And what also we have seen in Somalia that banks give money to those who already have money. They don't give money to those who need real money. Uh, we have seen that uh, a big portion of money could be lended to someone who is buying a piece of land, you know, and then keep it that piece of land for a year or two years and then sell it, you know, with a higher rate of the money he borrowed from the bank and then return the money. He did not create a job. He did not consume any service from the government. He did not pay any taxes. So all those things, you know, are, you know, signs that, you know, access to finance 
is and will have an impact of the de economic development. So I hope that uh, the professor from the central bank, you know, should know that information. And uh, even though we talk about the central bank of the basket building, I myself have seen that actually the, 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 the job the World Bank and the IMF are doing with the central bank has much contributed to, to the capacity building. I have seen the reports of an on-site inspection that they have done to the bankers, and I become very happy to see such reports, you know, be buried by inspectors of the Central Bank of Somalia. That gives us a hope, but still the role of the government is lacking. We talk about the cross-border relationship. Uh, we usually talk about that bankers in the bigger economies like American banks, you know, are not willing to do business with the bankers in Somalia. But we need to ask that question in Somalia. Is it our problem or their problem? Uh, we usually, you know, when we talk about with the central bank, we talk about among us. I've seen that many people are really uh, referring the problem to other parts. You know, when you, when you are a failure, you don't have to forward your failure to other parts, okay? So the central bank of Somalia, which represented by uh, a member of the board of directors should know that to solve the, process, the problem of cross-border relationship lies in Somalia, not in America or in other countries, not with the World Bank, not with the IMF, not with the commercial bank. It lies with the government of Somalia and the Central Bank of Somalia. You are the regulator and you are to regulate the market and you are to comply the requirements of the global banks that they need from us to do. So uh, since you are from the Central Bank here, I hope that you, I know you already know, but this is also to emphasize that the solution is our hands. I don't know what we are, when we will get the capacity to solve that problem, but it is in our hands, not in other hands. Uh, the access to financing, there is a big gap. I sometimes feel very bad that I'm a German of a bank that keeps the people's deposit, but doesn't lend them back. It's very bad. And when I try to solve that problem, I cannot, because if I give all that money and then there is a shock in the bank industry, then I don't have where to, where to lean on. So again, it is that, you know, the job that the central bank has to do. Uh, thank you so much. That's my involvement. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks a lot, Jibril. Uh, always, I know you wanted to respond to Abdinasser's uh, uh, questions. Uh, but if anybody else wants to please like to... raise your hand. Also, um, sorry, always, uh, uh, Dr. Always, I just want to mention this that like we are really running out of time, um, so we will respond to Abdinasser's uh, comment and then uh, have any other comment from the panelists, and and then uh, we we will we will need to close this. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Yasmin, and I would like to respond to the question of. Uh, and how vocational education and training course can help support young people to access to employment. And we have done a report on this human capital development, a very comprehensive report in Somalia. And I think one of the game changers for, for creating employment is uh, how young people could be attracted to, you know, skill development related to agriculture and uh, fisheries and also uh, livestock. But there is also other socio-cultural norms that really embed in young people to really uh, feel attractive to those uh, important sectors. Uh, young people really feel a uh, negative perception towards those uh, and employment sectors because they don't see that this is very uh, good uh, sector that they can really engage with. Of course, there are certain issues regarding on incentives that they can provide. So we have really come up with uh, a number of key imperative and, and, and or strategies or policies that can really help. Uh, this includes, uh, of course, uh, and, and establishing or really providing a very comprehensive, uh, holistic uh, campaign on how to really change, uh, you know, young people's perception and negative uh, mindset. Because uh, at the end of the day, if you don't have the, you know, uh, attractive uh, packages. Uh, for for potentially uh, for to potentially create jobs, uh, it will be very difficult. So one of the imperatives is just providing a scholarship uh, related to those sectors, agriculture and livestock. And I think one of the 
important mechanism is that uh, private sector education in Somalia can really help young people to, to feel attractive to uh, and provide a scholarship and also as well as uh, creating incentives and industries. Another key challenge is because we don't have the industries that can really accommodate and you know, skilled uh, technical and vocational um, and, and, uh, development skills because we don't have the uh, industries that can really you know, accommodate those young people when they graduate from this school. So I think uh, it, it will come back to, of course, expanding, uh, you know, establishing uh, or reviving industrial base that Somalia has before the, 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 the civil war, uh, before the civil war happened. And I think uh, this is one of the, uh, I think, imperatives that the government, as well as the other uh, diverse stakeholders work together to come up with how Somalia can really move forward from uh, low productive uh, uh, sectors to more modernized and uh, industrial uh, sectors. And another key challenge is, of course, of lack of investment. When you want to really come up with vocational education and training centers, you have to have a huge investment to really, uh, you know, develop those uh, centers that can provide and uh, skills and capacity development for young people. I think uh, I will stop here because uh, I don't have time to to really expand those uh, discussion. Uh, thank you very much again. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Awis. I think. Um... I think it's safe to stop here. I, I hope everybody is okay with that, um, the panelists. I know there was more uh, raised hands. I apologize. It's just we, we are really out of time. Um, I would like to thank uh, the World Bank Group for their participation and for their willingness to share their report for this forum. I would also like to thank the panelists and uh, the HIPS team members for putting this together. And I would also like to thank um, the everybody who joined all our distinguished guests uh, thank you for your comments for your remarks thank you for listening and um and participating um and if anybody has any anything to say uh, I'll, I'll let you say before we leave yeah very good all right guys. i guess i guess hussein is just i uh, want hussein wanted to say something professor uh, go ahead maybe uh, <laughs> Natasha might conclude for us as well. Yeah, no, I just wanted to thank you all. Actually, it was a very nice study and uh, it was a good initiative to take Dr. Afiare to uh, link the World Bank and the heritage and academics and uh, uh, the private sector. It was very well done. Uh, I was also going to ask, is Matthew and Natasha in Mogadishu now or are they in Nairobi? Where are they? <laughs> <laughs> they are in Nairobi. <laughs> there in Nairobi, okay. We'll bring you to Mukdisha one of those days. It will be safe. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, would Natasha say anything to conclude before we, or Jibril or anybody, or Matthias? Maybe I'll just come in briefly to say uh, thank you so much for this opportunity. We, we produce these reports and and yet the richness actually comes in the quality of these types of discussions. And I really hope that we can replicate what you've started today. This was really a fantastic initiative on your side. Um, thank you for being our collaborative partner in this regard. We had a meeting with all the CSOs and then Dr. Away said, let's do another one. I can help to convene a greater audience, let's do it. I said, all right, let, I'll take you on. And, and he's, really, he's really proved himself and I've enjoyed this immensely. I've learned so much from you and I'm humbled by this experience. So long may this continue. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Okay, uh, I want to thank everybody for uh, participating and I really want to thank the panelists uh, and uh, for, this rich, for this rich discussion. Uh, I also uh, wanted uh, to say thank you to the authors uh, uh, of the report. Uh, hopefully this is the first one and we will uh, continue uh, collaborating on different aspects uh, of Somalia's, uh, uh, I mean, uh, issues uh, that the bank is involved with as well. So thank you everyone. Thank you very much, Yasmin. You have done a wonderful job, appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.